Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 41, The History of Colombia. So today's drink of choice is Colombiana. Colombiana is a soda from the Posobon Company, a Colombian drink company that has been active since 1904 and is one of the largest in not only Colombia, but all throughout Latin America. Colombiana itself is a champagne cola drink, a type of soda popular throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. It's similar to Inca Cola or Iron Brew, so it tastes somewhat like bubblegum, but it's overall pretty creamy. It's a good drink if you're a fan of cream or champagne-like sodas, and overall, I liked it. The Republic of Colombia is located in northern South America, with the Caribbean Sea to the north, Venezuela to the east, Brazil to the southeast, Peru and Ecuador to the south, the Pacific Ocean to the west, and Panama to the northwest. Also, while most of the country is located on the South American continent, Colombia does actually control a series of islands in the Caribbean and Pacific, notably the archipelago of San Andres, Providencia, and Santa Catalina which had its own unique history and culture, although I won't really go too much into the islands for most of the episode. Colombia is a tropical country, but generally you'll see it described as being made up of half a dozen different regions. There's the insular region, which consists of the islands off the coast. Then there's the Caribbean coast, with a small desert in the far north, and the Pacific coast, which is very wet. In the middle, there's the Andes region, where the Andes Mountains are, which is where it is the coldest and also historically has been where most of the population is located. Then in the interior, there is the Orinoco region, which is flatter, and then there's the Amazon region, which is where the Amazon rainforest is and is also where historically there's been very limited development. Big thing to keep in mind is Colombia's geography is diverse, and its geography, particularly the Andes Mountains, has helped divide up the country. There are a little under 50 million Colombians. Like pretty much all of Latin America, most Colombians are mixed to a certain extent, with most people having some European, African, and indigenous ancestry. Most demographic breakdowns will say a majority of people are mestizo, or mixed, and white, with over 80% of the country defining themselves as belonging to these two groups. While many European ethnic groups have migrated to Colombia over the years, most white people will trace their origins to Spain. Another roughly 10% will identify as Afro-Colombian, mostly found along the Pacific coast, with Afro-Colombians often being divided into other subgroups like the Rizal people of the San Andreas, or the Palenquero people of the Caribbean coast. And then somewhere around 5% will identify as indigenous, with roughly 87 different indigenous people groups believed to live in the country, most being found in the Amazon region. Other smaller groups like the Roma, Lebanese, and Palestinians are also present. Language-wise, the vast majority of people will speak Spanish, the official language of the country. Also, apparently the Andes region has a very distinct accent. Some indigenous languages are still spoken in the country, with something like a million people speaking one or more indigenous languages. Many of these indigenous languages are on the decline, although recent efforts have been made to promote them in recent years. The Palenquero people I mentioned earlier also have their own unique Creole language, the Rizal people will often speak either English or their own Creole language, and in some parts of the interior, Portuguese is spoken owing to Brazilian influence in these regions. Finally, religion-wise, Colombia is a Catholic country, with over two-thirds being Catholic. In recent years, Catholicism has been retreating from its dominant position in Colombian society, with a growing Protestant population, particularly in the Amazon, and among the indigenous population, along with a growing number of irreligious people. Muslims, Jews, Eastern Orthodox, Mormons and several indigenous and syncretic religious groups also exist in the country. Before I start talking about Colombian history, I'd just like to briefly talk about three very useful sources I found while writing this episode. First, I read Colombia, A Concise Contemporary History by Michael J. La Rosa and Germain R. Mejia. The book goes over Colombian history from the War of Independence until 2012, when the book was published, detailing various important historical trends throughout Colombian history, ranging from Colombia's presence on the world stage, Colombia's economic development, the development of political rights in the country, and even a look at Colombian art with a particular focus on how each of these changes help influence and unite Colombia as a nation. It's a pretty good book on Colombian history, very interesting and very useful for someone who is just getting into Colombian history, or even Colombian culture, although I would have liked it if it discussed pre-1800s Colombian history. And the format of the book where each aspect of Colombian history is given its own chapter does get a little annoying because you do end up rereading about the same events over and over several chapters in a row. 
but it's still a good book that I would recommend. I also read Marco Palacios's Between Legitimacy and Violence, which details Colombian history from 1875 to 2002, with a particular focus on political violence and the driving factor for that violence. I would say that while La Rosa and Mejia is a much more optimistic and even aspiring look at Colombian history, Palacios' book, largely because it is much more focused on political violence, that, spoiler alert, will play Colombian history, is much more depressing. It's not an outright nihilistic or negative look at Colombia, but because political violence is the focus of the book, and it ends on kind of an ominous note, it is a more somber read. It's a very good book still, and I would really recommend it if you are curious on the conflict in Colombia and political violence. Finally, I'll recommend Season 5 of Mike Duncan's podcast Revolutions, which is all about the Latin American Wars of Independence, and mostly focuses on Simon Bolivar. The podcast is great, it's one of my favorite podcasts of all time, and I think the last two episodes of the season are some of the best podcast episodes Mike Duncan has ever done. It's just a great show, and if you want to learn more about the fight for Colombian independence or just that time period in South America, I can't recommend it enough. But let's start looking at Colombian history. Historians and archaeologists have found artifacts from various different indigenous societies dating all the way back to tens of thousands of years ago. Pretty much all of these different societies inhabited just a part of Colombia, owing to the vast geographic diversity of a country, and the Andes Mountains making it difficult to actually travel across the entire country. Looking at a map of pre-Columbian societies slash civilizations, you'll find most of them are found in the Andes region of the country, just owing to that region's cooler climate. Although indigenous tribes and people were of course found throughout in pretty much every part of the country. One of the most significant societies would be the Muisca Confederation, located in the center of the country. The Muisca were a collection of several different city-states that all united to band together to defend themselves against rival tribes and societies. The Muisca were noted for their rich mines and metalworking, with emeralds, gold, and salt all being important resources found within their territory. The Muisca were so rich with gold, it's believed that the confederation was the inspiration for the legend of El Dorado, or the City of Gold. Farming for stuff like potatoes and coca and textiles also formed an important part of their economy. The Muisca would be challenged in the 1500s by the Spanish. Spanish conquistadors in search of gold to make themselves rich began entering into Colombia by the early 1500s, setting up the first European settlements in South America in northern Colombia. By 1536, the Spanish came into contact with the Muisca, and after some failed expeditions that were wiped out due to disease, the Spanish managed to beat and subjugate the Muisca by 1540. In 1538, one of these Spanish expeditions would found the city of Bogota, the current capital and largest city of the country. Other Spanish expeditions would further expand Spanish influence south and east, pushing into what is now Venezuela and Ecuador. By 1600, Spain was the dominant power in the region, but they were still largely confined to the coast and the Andes, with the Amazonian interior being only partially controlled by the Spanish. The conquest of the Spanish brought with it a lot of death from both violence and new old world diseases. La Rosa and Mejia estimate that in 1535, there were roughly 4 million indigenous people in the country, but by 1600, there were only 1.5 million, and then by the 1650s, only 500,000. The Spanish would administer Colombia under the kingdom and then vice reality of New Granada, which also included Venezuela, Ecuador, and Panama, with Bogota as the colony's capital. The initial economy was mostly based around the gold found from the Muisca and other indigenous people, but Colombia wasn't as rich with gold as other Spanish territories like Mexico or Peru. Instead, the economy began turning to other economic ventures, like sugar and tobacco, and serving as a port or stopping point in the Spanish Empire. Indigenous labor was at first initially used, but as time went on and more natives died, African slaves began to be brought over. The port city of Cartagena would serve as a vital port for the slave trade, with many Africans being brought over to the port, before being sold to work in the mines on the Pacific coast or in farms across the country. Spaniards that moved into the region mixed and intermingled with the native and black population, which saw the birth of new racial classifications like mestizo, mulatto, criollo, and zambo being created. There seems to have been some historical debate on if Spanish America was a caste system with a strict hierarchy of whites from Spain, or peninsulares, higher than those whites born in the Americas, criollos, who were higher than the mestizo or other mixed people with some European blood, who were higher than the indigenous and black population, or if the lines of race and class were more fluid. It's my understanding that the consensus is leaning more towards the lines of race being blurred, but it was true that white landowners were far above their black slaves or indigenous peoples. New Granada entered into the 1800s with a lot of underlying tension. Some of this tension was driven by inequality that I had just touched up on between the unequal nature of Colombia, 
as economic inequality would increase between the various different peoples of New Granada. Also, tension between cities would slowly start to grow as different cities and regions developed their own unique identities, owing partially to the difficulty of traveling around New Granada. In the late 1700s, the Spanish removed the Jesuit priests from their New World colonies, which angered the colonial elites, since they would send their sons to the Jesuits to get an education, and just help them move up in life. Slowly, a sense began to creep in that Spanish America had its own identity distinct and separate from Spain, and that maybe, Spain was holding them back. It is in this environment that the Spanish-American Wars of Independence start to kick off. War in Spain and constitutional and institutional confusion in Spain led to new Spanish juntas, which eventually led to new governments to be set up in New Granada, reclaiming the independence of the state from Spain, led by new patriot governments. In 1811, however, the patriots themselves were divided between two primary groups, those who favored a strong centralized state, which formed a government based in Bogota, the free and independent state of Sundia Marca, and those who favored a more federalist model who formed their own state in Tuja, the United Provinces of New Granada. The centralists and federalists would fight amongst each other, and those who remained in support of the king, or just government back in Spain, the royalist. The United Provinces, with the assistance of Venezuelan revolutionary Simon Bolivar, managed to defeat the centralists in 1815, but shortly after, in 1816, the patriot forces in New Granada would be wiped out by royalist advances. Royalists would control the region for the next three years, cracking down harshly on the patriots or even just those who were born in America. The royalists would be driven out in 1819, Bolivar would liberate Venezuela in 1817, and with the assistance of Colombians upset with royalist rule, like, for example, Francisco de Palas Santander, would liberate Bogota in 1819, crossing the Andes during the rainy season, beating the Spanish in the Battle of Boyacá. In 1819, with Spanish forces in the region defeated, Bolivar and the other patriots were able to declare the independence of Gran Colombia, which would eventually, by 1822, include all the territory of New Granada. As a brief note, Gran Colombia wasn't actually the name of the state, it was the Republic of Colombia. Gran Colombia is just the title historians use to differentiate Gran Colombia with Venezuela and Ecuador from the current state of Colombia. Bolivar and his army would then go on to liberate Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia from the Spanish, driving them from South America. As a fun fact, Bolivar actually managed to campaign over more territory than Alexander the Great. Bolivar for a brief moment was a president of Gran Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia all at once. But problems back in Gran Colombia and politicking by rivals in Peru and Bolivia led Bolivar to retreat back home. Bolivar, while he had aided the Federalists in 1815, was actually a centralist, favoring a strong central government based in Bogota. This was pretty widely disliked by many, especially in Venezuela, Panama, and Ecuador, where Bogota was seen as almost a foreign power. Even Colombian Federalists like Santander began to grow annoyed with Bolivar as he set up a dictatorship, revolts throughout the country, war with Peru, and an almost successful assassination attempt on Bolivar in 1828 led in 1830 Bolivar, who was in failing health, to step down and he would die later that year. With Bolivar's death, Gran Colombia was split up, although Colombia continued to hold on to Panama. The death of Bolivar and Gran Colombia didn't end political tension in Colombia, however. Quickly, Colombia was divided between liberals and conservatives. The conservatives tended to back Bolivar's vision of a centralized state, while also supporting a strong Catholic church, and favored keeping the status quo on social and voting matters. The liberals, however, were heavily influenced by Santander, favoring a federal government, a secular state, and favored some limited social changes. The liberals seemed to have their strongholds historically in urban areas, on the coast, and among the black population of the country, while the conservatives seemed to get more support in the interior, among the church hierarchy, and maybe among the indigenous population. However, the big theme in both blocks was they were elitist organizations, usually built around rich, powerful families. The only people who could hold office were rich land-owning men, few were actually able to vote, and only radical liberals even hinted at touching the social question. The liberals and conservatives, while at first informal groups, would form political parties in the late 40s. Colombian society after independence did see some changes. More rights were given to Colombian citizens, with right to trial, freedom of expression, and popular sovereignty all enshrined rights for all citizens. However, in order to be a citizen, a man had to both own property worth 300 pesos, read and write, and be married, which excluded most people from being able to actually get their new rights. In the decades after independence, rights would somewhat be expanded, as in the 40s, with marriage and the reading part of the citizenship clause being removed, and property requirements being lowered in the 50s. 
Women would actually briefly get the right to vote in 1857 in the town of Velez, but this was quickly overturned. Black and indigenous Colombians were largely excluded from the political process as white men dominated the political system and made up the bulk of political elites. Black Colombians who fought with Bolivar did receive increased political rights, and in 1821, any slave born after that year who reached the age of 21 would be freed. Slavery would fully end until 1851. Economically, the country remained largely rural and agricultural, although products like aguardiente, a type of distilled alcohol, and quinine grew in importance. But overall, Colombia still had an economy and society that was largely disconnected from each other after independence. In the late 30s slash early 40s, the War of the Supremes would break out, as opposition towards the central government led to several years of conflict. The 40s were mostly peaceful, but with the abolition of slavery, conservatives upset with this tried and failed to remove the liberals from power. After another civil war in 1854, the Grenadine Confederation was set up, which had power given to the states, the church's influence being weakened, and divorce being legalized. Conservative governments in this confederation attempted to centralize the state, leading to a civil war in 1860, and by 1863, a new constitution was set up that favored a federal republic under the rule of radical liberals. These radical liberals sought to weaken the church by seizing their land and secularizing the education system, and tried to reduce the power of the presidency, and make it so a president could only serve a single two-year term. One might think that the radical liberals would try to expand suffrage, but they actually instead tried to restrict the right to vote away from the poor, believing that the poor were too easily swayed by the influence of the church. When voting did take place, it was often in a very hostile and even violent environment as many people would bring their machetes to the ballot box to secure their right to vote, and maybe prevent someone else from voting as well. By 1876, the radical liberals began to lose their influence as more moderate liberals were able to beat back a conservative revolt, which helped them take power. Then, in 1886, with moderate liberals growing closer to the conservatives, the radical liberals tried to retake power, but they ultimately failed. I've thrown out a whole bunch of different civil wars and different political changes in a roughly 50 year period. I don't think it's super important to remember all these different political changes in every single one of these civil wars, but more to know that Colombia post-independence was very violent, and by 1886, the conservatives would take power and create the 1886 constitution. The 1886 constitution would, unlike the previous constitutions, last over 100 years and would greatly shape Colombian politics. The 1886 constitution sought to roll back many of the radical liberal proposals. The government was reformed as a centralized state was set up, with power returning to the president in Bogota. Catholicism was made the official religion of the state, with the church given a predominant role in Colombian society and politics. The army was modernized and expanded, and civil liberties were rolled back as the press was cracked down on, women were given the legal status of minors in regards to property rights, guns were restricted, and capital punishment was encouraged. The constitution would defer that citizenship was granted on the basis of one being white, male, and Catholic. Colombia was given a distinctly socially conservative turn, and the next era of Colombian history, the regeneration, would see the conservatives dominate. The long-term effects of the Constitution were a strengthening of the Colombian state, so much so that the constitutional order would never again be completely overturned and solidified political power in the elite ruling class. While Colombia was changing politically, it was also moving east. A reinvigorated Catholic church would see it develop more missions among the indigenous population east at the same time more people began moving past the Andes into the less densely populated interior. Railroads, mail, and telegraph infrastructure, the rise of mass media, and to a lesser extent, newspapers attempting to reach beyond their local markets all helped connect the nation together. Coffee began to grow as an important resource. By the 1920s, coffee would become one of the country's most important exports. Actually, by that point, 80% of all of Colombia's foreign export earnings were from just coffee. This time would also see continued political tension, as conservatives favored traditional economic ventures like cattle herding or farming tobacco or other traditional products, while liberals favored banking and infrastructure reforms to modernize the Colombian economy. But political tension wouldn't just be economic differences or strong words. It would, like in previous decades, be violent. In 1895, liberals would try and fail to overturn the government. Then in 1899, a more violent war broke out, the Thousand Days War. The liberals again tried to overthrow the government and again failed. Importantly, the new centralized state that emerged after 1886 had successfully modernized the military. While previous rebellions could see ragtag militias win and secure power, the new army was large and powerful enough that it couldn't be beaten in a head-on conflict. 
The liberals in the summer of 1900 went from trying to fully take over the country to going into the bush to wage a guerrilla war. The war changed into a brutal conflict with widespread politicide as liberals massacred conservatives and conservatives massacred them right back. Tens of thousands to maybe even over 100,000 would die in the bloodiest civil war the country had experienced since independence. The war would finally end in 1903 with liberals and conservatives agreeing to lay down their arms. While the conservatives wouldn't be overthrown, it's hard to say either side really won the war. Colombia lost many people in the fighting, the economy was in tatters, and partisan divide was heightened. Probably the most humiliating result of the war would be Panama, a region that saw particularly brutal fighting and was a liberal stronghold break away, aided by American gunboats. Colombia was traumatized after the war, leading to a period of reconciliation among the political elites, as conservatives brought some liberal politicians into their cabinets. The next decades would be much more peaceful in comparison to previous decades, as a coffee boom in the 20s brought a certain level of prosperity, especially for economic elites. The oil and banana industry would begin, and companies like Postobon would be formed, helping give even more economic benefits to the country. The country also began to urbanize as more people were forced off their land by large landowners and moved either into the cities or, alternatively, into the untouched east. The church felt somewhat threatened by the changing dynamics occurring in Colombia and tried to influence the country more by discouraging drinking and encouraging some labor reform. Immigration was, to a certain extent, promoted by the Colombian state, similar to how Brazil and Chile tried to whiten their population, but for the most part, few would actually move to Colombia. Public education would grow, although still 70% of students wouldn't make it to the third grade. The education system did, however, mean that more women were able to get more opportunities, and over the next couple decades, more women would begin to enter the professional workforce. Finally, while the United States was hated in the aftermath of Panama leaving, by the 20s, Colombia and America began to grow close, and eventually the two would become so close that by the end of the century, Colombia would be one of America's most devoutly loyal allies in Latin America. The new era of peace didn't see much violence between liberals and conservatives, but violence did still occur. Firstly, several indigenous revolts would break out, most notably Quinton Limey's rebellion in 1916. Labor agitation would also grow, partially as a reaction to brutal working conditions in the banana plantations or oil fields, and partially due to Marxist ideas from Europe beginning to grow in Colombian society. Strikes became more common, unions were set up, land disputes occurred more frequently as people were pushed off their land, and by 1930, the Colombian Communist Party was formed. Infamously, in 1928, United Fruit Company workers went on strike, which saw the Colombian army intervene, where they killed likely over a thousand people. Finally, in 1932, war would break up with Peru. Peru and Colombia had, even during the days of Gran Colombia, been hostile towards each other and both disputed the border between them, resulting in several small conflicts. In 1932, Peruvian troops entered into the city of Leticia. Colombian troops would spend a year fighting the Peruvians and ended up driving the Peruvians back and retaking their territory. The war would further grow the Colombian state. The conflicts in the aftermath of the Thousand Days War would serve as a precursor to further tension in Colombia and would point that further violence wouldn't just be between liberals and conservatives. The liberals finally managed to outright gain control of the presidency in 1930 with the election of Enrique Olaya Herrera. The liberals would dominate the presidency for the next couple years via a combination of voter fraud and a new expanded voter base. The liberals had begun to move left, appealing to the urban working class, and the communists actually started to align themselves more with the liberals. Parts of the liberal party began to embrace almost socialistic talking points and push for more labor and social reform. At the same time, the conservatives also began to radicalize as parts of the party began to look towards Franco, Spain, and fascist Italy for inspiration. World War II would see Colombia join the Allies, mostly just providing the Allies with raw materials, and there was a single case of a Colombian ship engaging with a U-boat. Importantly, it saw the radical wings of both parties grow more hostile towards each other, as the radical conservatives backed the Axis while the liberals backed the Allies. In 1946, the conservatives retook the presidency. It was in this environment that liberal firebrand and hugely popular politician Jorge Eliseter Gayatón began to run for president for the 1949 election. Gayatón backed a populist program of rooting out corruption, supporting leftist economics, and had the backing of both the poor of Colombia and the Liberal Party leadership. He is often compared to other 20th century South American populists, like Perón, just for his anti-establishment message and widespread support among the masses. The 1949 election looks set for a Gayatón victory. However, this victory would never come. On April 8, 1948, Gayatón was assassinated. The death of Gayatón infuriated the people of Bogotá, leading to a massive riot known as El Bogotazo. As the killer of Gayatón was beaten in the streets moments after the assassination, and widespread death and destruction would take place over the next couple of hours, El Bogotazo would lead to La Violencia, or literally just the violence. 
Liberals and communist guerrillas took to the jungles, waging a guerrilla war against the conservatives. And scenes from the Thousand Day War of mass politicide, widespread racial violence, and brutal massacres returned to the country. The violence was most predominant in the rural countryside, as something like 80% of the over 200,000 people that would die were poor rural men. There were few instances of outright battles, mostly just massacres of civilians. While the deadliest period of La Violencia would only last until the early 50s, guerrillas would continue to fight on until the 60s. By the time it was over, there was no one in the country who wasn't affected, who hadn't either been hurt, hurt others, or knew someone close to them who was involved in some way. Every single day since April 8, 1948, there has been some level of outright political violence in the Colombian countryside. I want to briefly note an argument Palacios makes in his book that I am very sympathetic towards. He says that La Violencia was largely due to the absence of the state. The Colombian state had failed to penetrate into the rural interior, failing to actually influence the people in the far-off provinces. Instead of people being able to solve disputes through the state, people took matters into their own hands. If a local official was oppressing or harming you in some way, you couldn't get the state to step in. The state was, quite frankly, often very corrupt and heavily in the pockets of big businesses, or just not there. So the only way you would be able to deal with whatever local dispute you had was with violence. The state was seen somewhat as this far-off, illegitimate force, and after all, very few were actually voting for their politicians. With the 1949 election, a high point in Colombian turnout at the time, seeing only 23% of the population actually vote. This discouraged trying to work within the system. This problem ultimately is what has continued to plague Colombia as the state is unable to penetrate into the isolated rural areas or even just urban slums. These areas will be the areas in future decades that we will see the most violent groups emerge from. With Gayatan dead, conservative Larulario Elatario Gomez Castro won the presidency in 1949. Gomez was a part of the radical wing of the conservative party, heavily influenced by Francoist thought, tried to strengthen the power of the presidency, and sent troops to Korea to fight the communist north in the Korean War. Gomez was pretty widely disliked due to his more extreme views and authoritarian rule, and by 1953, the political establishment in the country pretty much hated him. That year, the military overthrew him with the support of the political elites and set up a military dictatorship under Gustavo Rojas Pena. Rojas's rule was noted for the military taking an active role in building up the state, with the police forces placed under the Ministry for Defense and the military building several important infrastructure projects throughout the country. Rojas's rule would also see La Violencia toned down, as he offered amnesty to many, leading most, but not all, to lay down their arms. Women would be given the right to vote in 1957, although no elections would be held under the dictatorship. Unions, especially public sector ones, would grow under Rojas's rule. This scared the traditional political elites, and after a crackdown on opposition press, liberal and conservative party elites held a strike which forced Rojas to step down and civilian rule to return in 1958. The return of civilian rule again saw the liberals and conservatives emerge as the two main political camps. However, seeing how division against each other had led to so much bloodshed, and ultimately weakened both of them, the two parties decided to work together. The National Front was set up that saw liberals and conservatives support each other's political candidates and share power. Liberals would take the presidency in 1958, then the conservatives in 1962, then liberals again in 1966, and finally conservatives once again in 1970. The government was able to avoid bloodshed between conservatives and liberals, and since the 60s, partisan hatred between the two parties has significantly reduced. The 60s would see more and more of rural Colombia fall into the hands of rich landowners, and since political elites were working together, no one really pushed for land reform. Trade associations became quite strong, and Colombia grew even closer with the U.S. The National Front, which would last until 1974, had ended one of the biggest problems in Colombia, liberal versus conservative violence. But it was also largely an undemocratic system where no real opposition existed. So with no real ability to change the system, people particularly those from the Marxist left upset with the growing consolidation of power in the hands of the elite, took to the jungles to fight the government. This would see the start of the modern-day Colombia conflict. Several different leftist groups have emerged over the years to fight the government. I'm not going to go over every single one, but I'll go over the four largest. First, I'll talk about the National Liberation Army, or ELN. The ELN was formed from a combination of students, priests influenced by leftist liberation theology, and workers who went to Cuba to study and train for a Castro-style revolution in Colombia. In 1964, they began their guerrilla war, but they were ultimately unsuccessful, suffering from a massive loss in numbers in the 70s in a disastrous campaign in Antioquia and infighting in the group. 
they would reemerge in the 80s as a powerful force on the Venezuelan border. The next group, the Popular Liberation Army, or EPL, was always a small force. They were a Maoist and then Hoxha, a breakoff of a communist party, being popular in the Uraba region, but never as large or imposing as the other guerrillas. We have to look at the April 19, 1970 election to find the origins for the next group. Rojas tried to run as president in 1970 with a left nationalist message that got the support of rural priest, anti-imperialist, the urban poor, and disillusioned liberal and conservative party bosses. His run would fail, likely due to fraud, but his supporters would serve as the nucleus for the April 19th movement, or M19. M19 served as almost Robin Hood-like figures, and unlike the other guerrillas, largely took their fight into the cities and didn't have as much presence in the rural countryside. They were very dominant in the 80s, storming the Dominican Republic Assembly in 1980, stealing the sword of Bolivar, and actually taking over the Palace of Justice, the location of the Supreme Court, and then being removed in a bloody siege. However, the largest guerrilla group for pretty much the entire conflict will be the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC. FARC emerged from the liberal guerrillas who fought in La Violencia. This ingrained them in the local communities who had historically suffered with violence, and quickly, FARC began to grow after its founding in 1964. FARC, the ELN, and the EPL were inspired by Fanon, Mao, and Castro's theories on a rural guerrilla war helping to achieve a political revolution, and tried to form their own FACOs, or small bands of revolutionary fighters throughout the country. While Marxist theories did inspire the guerrillas, as the years went by, it also became increasingly clear that money was also a large driver for these groups, as guerrillas could get rich illegally exporting oil, like the ELN, taxing cocaine and heroin producers, like FARC, extorting money from large landowners, like the EPL and FARC, or just kidnapping people and holding them for ransom, a tactic used by all guerrillas, including M19. I had mentioned cocaine and heroin producers, which would start to grow in the 80s. Several criminal organizations would start to be formed in the late 70s, initially dealing with marijuana trafficking. However, in the 80s, as cocaine became more popular in the U.S., many would turn to trafficking cocaine in large numbers. By the 90s, two main cartels emerged that dominated Colombia. There was the Cali Cartel, based in the city of Cali. They were often referred to as the Gentlemen of Cali because they were somewhat legitimized by their lack of violence, at least compared to the other major drug cartel, and the fact that they were heavily invested in many legitimate businesses in Colombia. However, the Cali Cartel and other organizations also infamously carried out social hygiene, where gays, prostitutes, street children, the homeless, or others seen as socially undesirable were exterminated in the streets. The other major cartel was the Medellin Cartel, based in the city of Medellin. Famously, this cartel was headed by Pablo Escobar, who would at one point become the richest criminal on earth. Escobar and the Medellin cartel was quite famous for both trying to help the poor with several community projects, but also their brutality, especially at the height of their power. In the late 80s to early 90s, Escobar would be labeled a narco-terrorist, committing massacres like the bombing of Flight 203, the DOS building bombing, and assassinating liberal presidential candidate Luis Carlos Galán. Escobar would eventually be killed in 1993 after infighting a conflict between his cartel and Cali and a year-long manhunt by the state. Cali would be toppled in 1998, and newer smaller cartels would take their place. Also, if you are curious on the drug wars in Colombia, there's a pretty good TV show on Netflix, Narcos, that dramatizes the rise and fall of both the Medellin and Cali cartel. It's a drama, so it's not the most accurate, but it does broadly get things right. The YouTube channel History Buffs did a series talking about the historical accuracy of the show's first two seasons on YouTube, so if you are curious more about that period, I would recommend that series of videos. The cartels had an interesting relationship with the guerrillas. Escobar, Cali, and the other cartels would in the 80s form a group dedicated to wiping out M19, due to M19 kidnapping a sister of a high-level cartel boss. But also, there is a theory that M19 besieged the Palace of Justice at the behest of Escobar. Oftentimes, the cartels would form temporary alliances with the guerrillas, allowing the cartels to operate in their territory, outside of the law, while giving a part of the profits to the guerrillas. Other times, the cartel would just form their own organizations that would protect them from the guerrillas, the law, or each other. The largest and most infamous of these paramilitaries would be the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, or AUC. The AUC can trace its origins to several older anti-communist militias the Colombian state and America had formed to help fight off the guerrillas. After one of these militias' leaders were killed by FARC, the sons of the leader would then go on to form the AUC in 1997. The AUC would be one of the deadliest and most brutal groups in Colombia, 
going on to massacre entire rural villages, targeted trade unionists, land reformers, and human rights activists, and would kill tens of thousands. It's believed something like 45% of all the people killed in the entire Colombian conflict were killed by the AUC and its successors. While the AUC worked often with the drug cartels, it also worked a shocking amount with large corporations, with Coca-Cola being accused of using them to kill union organizers, and even Posobon has been accused of working with the AUC. While the paramilitaries and drug cartels would grow in the 80s and 90s, there were some more positive signs that Colombia might be going in a better direction. By the end of the millennium, both Cali and the Medellin cartels would be eliminated, and several leftist groups did begin to lay down their arms. In 1990, M19 laid down their arms and formed a political party, the Alternative Democratic Pole, and most of the EPL would also end their violent struggle in 1991. A smaller group of folk rebels would also form the Patriotic Union to contest elections. However, those leftists that tried to operate within the system tended to be targeted. Firstly, they were targeted by the paramilitaries, who didn't want leftist activists to challenge the status quo and potentially harm their position in Colombia. Secondly, they were targeted by those guerrillas, who chose to stay in the jungle and fight, since they were accused of selling out and working with the state. Thousands of ex-guerrillas would be killed. This ultimately discouraged future surrender with the Colombian state and encouraged further militancy, since surrendering might mean being assassinated. Peace talks in 2002 broke down. Massacres and violence would continue on, with one of the most violent being the Bohaya massacre in 2002, where over 100 civilians were killed in fighting between FARC and the AUC. Demand for change in Colombia's system had been occurring for a while. In 1991, Colombia would get a new constitution that tried to bring about greater social equality and bring much-needed changes to the Colombian state. It unambiguously gives Colombian citizenship to all over the age of 18, secularized the country, promised more social rights, and decentralized the state, although the unitary model was still kept in place. While the constitution wouldn't fundamentally upend the status quo, it did help lead to changes in Colombia. The main political parties were weakened, and starting in the 90s, breakoffs and splits began to occur. New political forces began to win political office and power, although they were quite small in the 90s. The economy would also change by the end of the 20th century. Coal and flowers became an important part of the Colombian economy, and in the 90s the government began to privatize parts of the economy. This helped contribute to a recession in the late 90s due to a loss in state revenue, although economic aid from the U.S. helped stabilize the country. In 2002, Alvaro Uribe would win the presidency. While Uribe rose to prominence in the 90s as a liberal, he would that election run under his own political movement, making him the first Colombian president in almost 100 years to be elected who wasn't a liberal or conservative. Uribe was very much right-wing in his leadership of the country, continuing to promote neoliberal economics and promote foreign investment in the economy. He opposed peace talks and began a successful military campaign against the guerrillas, greatly weakening them and targeting their bases in nearby Ecuador. He also brought the AUC to the peace table, and by 2008, the AUC was dissolved with several of its higher-profile members in jail, although several breakoffs of the AUC would continue to fight the guerrillas and the state. Uribe was popular among many in the country for his achievements, especially greatly reducing violence in the country, and for most of his presidency was looked on positively. However, in the late 2000s, by the end of his rule, Scandals began to come out of corruption Uribe partook in, some of his allies holding ties to the paramilitaries, and infamously, the false positive scandal. This is where Colombian soldiers would kill civilians, claim them as guerrillas, and then receive a promotion or some other benefit. Uribe would be succeeded by Juan Manuel Santos in 2010. Santos, initially an ally of Uribe, would break with him, pushing for a peaceful end to the conflict with FARC and continue negotiations. In 2016, an agreement was signed promising FARC to lay down its weapons in exchange for FARC getting some political influence in Colombia's legislature and some social reforms to be carried out. The peace deal was then rejected in a tightly contested referendum later that year, although a revised peace deal would still be carried out. This officially ended FARC's over 50-year campaign to overthrow the Colombian state, leaving the ELN officially the largest guerrilla group in the country. However, a decent chunk of FARC's membership refused to lay down their arms, with many fearing the bloodshed that had occurred in the 90s might return, and some ex-guerrillas struggling to adjust to civilian life after years in the jungle. Uribe's supporters would return to the presidency with Ivan Duque in 2018. Duque would support a conservative turn, backing privatization, and opposing peace deals with the ELN. Duque would suffer with massive protests during his presidency over corruption, economic inequality, police brutality, and just the general state of affairs in the country, with hundreds of thousands turning up in the streets. Duque would leave in 2020 in a very tense and polarized climate. Elections held in 2022 saw politicians from outside the political establishment do well and make significant gains. 
I actually made an episode on Colombian political parties while elections were going on if you want to see which political parties are currently operating in Colombia. It's old, and I think there's a lot more context I probably should have given for many of the parties, but if you want to listen to it, I'll put a link in the description. In the presidential elections that year, Gustavo Petro won. Petro was the first leftist to win a presidential election in Colombia. Petro was actually originally a guerrilla in M19, but with the rest of the group laid down arms in 1990, and then went to participate in national and local politics, becoming the mayor of Bogota in 2012. Petro's presidency has seen him try to invest more in getting cocaine farmers to turn to more legitimate avenues, increase welfare spending, and working to protect the environment and advancing peace talks with the ELN and other guerrillas. Petro's presidency has earned him praise from his supporters and leftists, but many establishment politicians and right-leaning Colombians strongly dislike him, and Petro's son going to trial for alleged corruption and just dislike for his policies have led to several protests against his rule and a drop in the polls. In terms of overall trends for Colombia, Colombia is becoming richer and its GDP is rising, but economic inequality and poverty continue to plague the country, especially in the urban slums and rural countryside. An informal and illegal economy still exist. Most famously, stuff like drugs are produced and then transported across the world, but also illegal logging and mining operations continue to be a problem, especially in areas with poor communities. Guerrillas like the ELN and paramilitaries like the Gulf Clan, while not as big as they were in previous years, do still exist. The latest attack I could find was a series of car bombings claimed by ex-FARC members in late September, after which they announced a ceasefire that would take place between them and the government starting in early October. Peace has not fully come to Colombia just yet, but it does look like hopefully the worst of the conflict is over. So why does Colombia exist? Colombia was a creation of Spanish colonialism, but it has evolved into becoming what it is today. Colombia's geography has hampered efforts to bring it together, even leading to the separation of Gran Colombia into four different countries, and helping create a lot of political conflict and tension between various different political outfits. Today, Colombia is still trying to solve the disparities it faces. While it is an uphill battle, there are signs that the wind might be shifting, and a country that has had so much bloodshed may finally have a moment of peace. Up next, we will go off the southeast coast of Africa to Comoros. Prepare for Indonesian migration, the French, a disputed number of islands, and a lot of coups. So, thanks for listening, thanks for watching. I feel like this episode is going to come out to be a, a lot longer than I expected. Um, that seems to be a little bit of a trend for when I'm talking about the history of South American countries. Which overall actually isn't that bad. I actually, personally, I'm finding myself enjoying learning more and more about South American history. But yeah, up next, uh, hopefully I will do Moldovan political parties. I have the script fully written. I'm just waiting for someone to get back to me. They're proofreading it. So hopefully they'll get back to me soon and then I will release that. But I also will start working in the meantime on South Korean political parties. And then I will do the history of Comoros. But yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you want, you can email me at whydocountriesexist at gmail.com for your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. Take care. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. The sources I use for this video are ABC's Australia's News Report, Paramilitary Death Squads, Colombia, Cornica Pan America's videos, Brief Political History of Colombia, and Political and Cultural Geography of Colombia, Mike Duncan's podcast, Revolution Season 5, DW's documentary video, Colombia, The Long Road to Peace After the Civil War, Geography Now's video on Colombia, Inside Crimes article, Court Ruling Seeks Controversy Over Colombia's Para Economy, Colombia, A Concise Contemporary History by Michael J. La Rosa and Germain R. Mejia. Latinx for Social Movements page on the Muisca. Los Angeles Times article, Opinion, Struggles Between Gustavo Petro and Colombian Media Stir Latin American Populism. Marco Palacios' book, Between Legitimacy and Violence. Statistica's page, How Many Victims Has Colombia's Armed Conflict Claimed? Telesur's article, Coca-Cola Accused of Funding Colombian Death Squad. Vice News Report, Colombia is Rising Up, The Gangs That Inherited Pablo Escobar's Drug Empire, Cooking, cooking with Cocaine, and Why Colombia's Peace Deal is Failing, and finally, Wikipedia.